afternoon and welcome to uh, Law Power Hour. Today we have Attorney Regina Thomas with us. Regina, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Regina Thomas is uh, the assistant or deputy chief counsel for the civil law group of the Legal Aid Society and Defenders Association. And Regina Thomas is here to share with us everything that goes on at that organization, which benefits all of us in the community. Would you tell us a little bit about your organization? Sure. I'd like to start off by saying that Legal Aid and Defender Association is the largest nonprofit private law firm in the state of Michigan. The law firm actually has three law groups. The first is the Federal Defender Office. We also have the State Defender Office and the Civil Law Group, which is where I work. The Federal Defender Office handles criminal cases on the federal level. The State Defender's Office handles uh, criminal cases in Wayne County and the Civil Law Group provides legal assistance to low and moderate income residents in Wayne, Oakland and Macomb County. Our office was started in 1909 and we continue to this day to provide assistance. As far as the Civil Law Group is concerned, we do provide assistance, as I said, to low and moderate income residents in Wayne, Oakland and Macomb County. You do have to we do have to determine financial eligibility for our services and as far as our services are concerned in the tri-county area there are over 600,000 people who are eligible for our services. Okay. Let's talk about the criteria for a few minutes. How does one establish eligibility to have services through your organization? Okay. Well, as I indicated, we are looking for people who are low to moderate income. So we, we don't like to tell people, you know, if you make this amount of money, you'll be eligible for our services. We want people to call us. We want to do the eligibility ourselves because we don't want people to count themselves out for our services because we do have factors that we look at. So, but we do look at between 120 to 200 percent of poverty and those guidelines are set by the federal government. We also can only provide assistance to people who are citizens of the United States or have some form of legal status. When you talk about 120 to 200 percent of poverty, uh, give us a number, a general number. I know this isn't going to be the rule, but it's going to give us a general number so if people want to call your organization to get help, they know what the baseline might be. Sure, so very low threshold. If you are a, a household of one and you make approximately $14,000 a year, you would qualify for our services. Okay, now you've been involved in what I call public interest law of your life, haven't you? Yes, for about 20 years now. And you're trying to continue on your mission right now by running for judge in the Third Circuit, correct? Yes, that's correct. We wish you the best of luck in that election. Thank you. Now, in terms of your uh, duties. What are your duties with the Legal Aid and Defender's Office? What do you do? I am responsible for community relations and governmental affairs. So what I do is I work with the community to identify partnerships and areas of collaboration and I also communicate with our elected officials on the state, local and federal level. And as it relates to the partnerships and collaboration, Legal Aid does have a medical legal partnership that is active with Beaumont Hospital and that is also active in the Brightmore area of the city of Detroit. How does that work? in terms of the collaborative effort. What's the idea behind that? Well, one of the things that we found is that we are working, uh, generally speaking, with people whose life they're in crisis. And so we wanted to create collaborations and partnerships so that we could ensure that our client population doesn't have to drive all over the city to get services. So we looked at agencies who were already providing services to what we consider to be our client population. So it's typically social service agencies and, and the like. And we found an area of synergy because if you're already going to Starfish Family Services to receive social work services, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you could go there and if you had a legal problem, you could talk to an attorney on site. And so that's sort of what we've done uh, within Bright in the area of Brightmore and also in the area of Cody Rouge. Now, in terms of Brightmore, you're there when Beaumont Hospital's there. Yes. And what day of the week are you in Brightmore? We're there the second Friday of every month, and that is a part of our medical legal partnership with Beaumont Hospital, which is called Legal Aid for Children and Families. And we go into the Brightmore area, and we're partnering with Beaumont Hospital as well as Covenant Care. So we provide uh, dental screening is provided. Uh, 
medical screening and then legal assistance is provided on site. And City Covenant Church also provides any number of services to the residents in the area that come on that day. So it's it's really an opportunity for the residents to have one-stop shopping, so to speak, to get their needs met. As you know, my firm is there on the third Friday of every yes. month providing legal services in the same manner that your organization does. Yes. And what goes along with this really important for the public to know is that they have forgotten harvest every week right. on site, two days a week at City Covenant. And it brings in a lot of people who have issues, not only issues related to their health, but related to their ability to handle their financial needs and to shop right, and take care of their legal issues. You know, a lot of people have a lot, uh, what I, I say, apprehension about going to legal aid. And why shouldn't people have these fears about coming to legal aid? Well, the first thing is because we're, we're there to help. I, everybody that I work with really has a heart for our client population, and they want to help. And they're interested in helping. I think sometimes that I think sometimes people are ashamed and perhaps embarrassed to come and ask for help, but that's what we're there for. In other words, you want to be a backstop for people who have problems. You got their back, and you want to make sure that they're taken care of. Absolutely. Now, some of the areas that you're involved in, your organization is involved in, are like eviction, for example. How often do you deal with eviction problems through your organization? Well, on a daily basis, we actually have outreach Monday through Thursday. So we could get a calls about any number of issues. Right now, our level of services are really about um, keeping people in their homes, stabilizing their situation, and getting money in the home. So we do provide assistance in the area of mortgage and tax foreclosure. We also provide assistance in the area of landlord-tenant. We are primarily focusing right now on subsidized housing because we see that as a way of stabilizing uh, families that are in crisis. We want to ensure that people who have Section 8 vouchers are able to maintain those vouchers. So we're fighting very, very hard to assist those families. We also provide assistance in the area of public benefits as well as consumer law. I want to talk with you a little bit about Section 8 because there are some things that people really do not understand. For example, did you know that if you're on Section 8 and you're receiving mail for other individuals who do not live at your residence, they're counted in terms of the total income for that address? Yes. So what's your best advice for people who are receiving Section 8 subsidized housing? Always be honest about the people who are living in your home. Do not place yourself in a situation where you have to prove who lives there. Because if someone is getting mail there, then it's likely, well, it's like someone would believe that they're actually living there. So you have to be honest about the number of people that are living in your home and also your income that's coming into your home. Because if you don't, you put your voucher in jeopardy. When you put your voucher in jeopardy, that means you can be totally removed from, from sec Section 8. Absolutely. And then the state comes after you financially and wants a repayment. Is that correct? That's that's correct. Okay, now in terms of the subsidies, you go one step beyond what other organizations do. You actually help individuals get food stamp subsidies and other subsidies. Is yes. that true? Yes. And we actually have a project that we are that's funded by Ford Motor Company and we do food stamp clinics and we do those quarterly. And we try to work with some of the schools in the area, and we go out and we sit down with the families and we look at whether or not they're receiving food stamps, whether or not they should receive food stamps. And if they are receiving food stamps, we try to determine whether or not they're receiving the right amount. We also provide other various legal services while we're there because we found, typically speaking, our clients have more than one legal issue. So we do help with food stamps. We do also assist people who need to come up for recertification and they may have um, had their food stamps terminated because they haven't complied. And so we try to assist them with the appeals process as well. Now, in terms of your outreach program, how does that work? Well, our outreach, we're all over the city. We're all over Wayne County, actually, and we're also in Macomb as well as Oakland County. And if you go to our website, which is www.legalaiddetroit.org, you can find our websites, that are, our outreach sites that are open to the community. We're active in the Cody Rouge area of the city of Detroit, 
we're active in the Brightmore area of the city of Detroit, and we do respond to a request to come out and do clinics in the community. Now, if I wanted to tell people that they could contact you or your organization, could you give us a number that they can call to get information? Sure. Our intake line is 877-964-4700. Or 967 5800. You can also contact us online. We do allow people to open up cases in the area of housing and public benefits on our online intake. If somebody is living in a shelter, does your organization have the ability to help that individual get out of the shelter and find housing? Well, we can provide with some of the issues that um, have led to housing, to their, to their homelessness. We are active at NSO, we're also active at COTS, and we're also active at the Detroit Vet Center. So we will come in and we'll provide legal assistance on some of the issues that may have gotten someone into a situation where they're homeless and try to get money back into their home. Do you help individuals with SSI or DIB claims? Absolutely. And do you help them with veterans claims? We do not help with veterans claims at this time in-house. We will refer to pro bono attorneys in the community for that issue. Okay, now these are the services that are provided on the civil side, correct? Yes. Are you involved in services on the criminal side? I am not, but what I will say with regard to services as it relates to our state defender's office and our federal defender's office, you cannot contact our office directly to receive assistance. Those cases are assigned to our office through the Courts Assignment Center. We're going to take a break for a minute. We're going to come back and talk about some of your experiences working in the juvenile justice system. Okay. Thank you. Are you in legal trouble? Are you in need of legal advice? Or just have general legal questions? Watch Law Power Hour and get your questions answered by experienced attorneys who are experts in their field. Know your rights. Watch Law Power Hour, hosted by Barry Keller, attorney at law, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. here on WHPR, Detroit Live. I wanted to talk to you about the juvenile justice system and your experiences. I know when I reviewed uh, your uh, biography and background that you worked in the juvenile justice system for a period of years. Is that true? Yes, I did that off and on for about 14 years of my 20-year legal career, and that really has been my passion. I started, when I came out of law school, I started practicing law, and I started representing children in abuse and neglect situations. And while I was representing those children, I identified that some of my clients were also picking up delinquency cases, and it was my desire to ensure that my clients only had one attorney and that they didn't have to have several attorneys in their lives because that's not normal. So I also started to handle delinquency cases as well. Okay, in terms of handling delinquency cases, what kind of cases were you handling? Well, my, my clients could have been charged with anything from truancy from home or from school to carjacking or armed robbery. And did you discover that there's a pattern in this area, unfortunately, that exists? 
one of the things that I noticed with my delinquency clients and as well as my abuse and neglect clients is that they were just the same kids. A lot of the kids who ended up picking up delinquency cases sometimes, well most often than not, came from situations or circumstances where they were being neglected and or abused. And what I further identified was that they were not getting the assistance that they needed in school. So they were already on the train track and they were already in that school to prison pipeline. Put the fault at the home or you put it at the school? Well, I think it's twofold. Um, when you have parents who are neglectful and you have a school system that's not providing children with the assistance that they need, not providing them with a free and appropriate education and providing them with the additional special education services that they need, you don't have a parent at home that's going to push the school to do what needs to be done. So what's created is a perfect storm for these children. They're left to their own devices. And do you think the school system fails the children because they identify what I call suspect problems in terms of their ability to learn, learning deficiencies, and cast these kids aside and put them into some type of special education program. So by the time they reach the third or fourth grade, they start shutting down. Well, I think that as it relates to African American men or males, that there is an overdiagnosis of ADHD in our community. And as a result of that, I believe that children are treated a certain way. And I do agree that by the time they reach a certain age, they do shut down. A lot of the clients that I saw in the um, delinquency system and once I began to work at the prosecutor's office for a period of time, I identified that they may have stayed in school at least until high school, but they stopped learning about the third grade. So um, there, there is more work to be done in that area, definitely. And what do you attribute that to, the school system or, or the family issue? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that the lack of resources in the community um, has contributed to uh, some of the failures that I see uh, in the school system as well as in the home. If you were to correct the situation, what would you do to correct the situation in terms of to get the young people engaged so that they stay in school and they get educated? What advice would you give to the families? Well, to, to me it's about resources. It's about having children uh, appropriately placed. So if you have a child who is, by the fourth grade, deciding not to want to go to school on a regular basis, you have to ask why. Well, why don't you want to be in school? Sometimes it's, I don't understand the work. It could be that I'm being bullied. If it's one of those situations where the child is identifying that they don't understand the work, then what probably needs to happen is that an individualized education plan needs to be done for that child. The child needs to be evaluated to identify whether or not there are some type of special education services that can be provided to bring them up to speed, to keep them in school, to keep them engaged. Um, and you have to have resources to do that. I think that teachers have a very, very hard job, particularly in the city of Detroit, when you have young people who are coming to school who are ill prepared to learn and we're expecting teachers to be uh, social workers. We're expecting teachers to meet all of the children's needs that should have been met at home before they're able to teach them. And so I think that's a burden as well on the teachers. So there's, we as a community, I think, need to do more. So where would you start? In the home? In the school? I would definitely start in the home. Um, I, I would definitely start in the home with children, making sure that they get what they need at home. Kids can't learn if they're coming to school and they haven't slept the night before because there are things going on in their home that they should not be exposed to. Kids can't learn if they're not eating. They can't learn if they're in a home that's cold with no heat. Um, you can't expect them to go to school and learn. Um, so many times in, in impoverished areas, we're looking at kids, the only place that they eat is at school. That's why your organization exists, to make sure that the heat's on, the lights are on, the rent's paid, and the parents have some subsidy so that they can take care of their kids. Absolutely, absolutely. I know some people, they look, at, they look at public benefits and they think that people are taking from the system, but that is not the case. You know, there is a limit to the amount of time someone can receive aid in our state, and the amount of aid that families get, it is not, it's, it's basically subsistence. So people aren't getting rich. With getting food stamps or getting family independence payments. They're barely making it with those payments that come into the home. Now in terms of representing these individuals as juvenile, I hate to use the term delinquent, but that's what they're classified <laughs> that's what as. They say, that's exactly right, right. And when they're in the system and they're over in the Lincoln Hall of Justice, you find that these kids are dropping out of school, don't you? Yes. 
Yes. And, you know, and a lot of times the jurist or the judge that's involved in the case, that's part of the treatment plan for them to stay in school, to finish school, to get the services that they need. And sometimes that's what it takes. It takes for the court to order that children be provided certain services in order for them to get them. What advice would you give to parents today? Now we're just coming on into summer. School's out of session for the summer. Kids are going to be around the house. How to keep track of your children, for example, to make sure that they're not going to be in the Frank Murphy Hall of Justice come this September. My mother used to say, and I'm sure everybody else's mother used to say this as well, but idle hands are the devil's playground. So programming, programming, programming. There are so many organizations out here that are providing programs for children in the summer. Get your kids involved in something. Find out what, they're, what they like and turn that into a hobby. Um, but you definitely have to keep kids programmed. Get them involved. If it's sports, a day camp, summer camp, overnight camp, but they've got to be able to do something besides staying at home and, and finding a way to get in trouble. Now, your organization, does it help assist in getting these young people the programs that are available? Well, we don't do that formally, but most of our attorneys are well versed in the resources that are available in the community. And that comes from some of the networks and the partnerships and collaborations that we've cre created in the community. Now, your collaborative effort with William Beaumont Hospital is to ensure that people are healthy, correct? Right. So through our medical legal partnership, we look at what is determined, social determinants of health. And we've identified that some of the medical issues that people have are not all medical issues. Some of them are legal issues. And a prime example of that would be a child who is suffering from asthma. Perhaps this child is consistently at the emergency room, and the emergency room doctor may think that the family is not is non-compliant with its medical treatment. And the mother may be in a situation where she doesn't have any utilities in her home and so the child cannot use their nebulizer regularly and so that's why she's forced to use the emergency room because the asthma is constantly flaring up so in that situation if the mother is willing and open and honest with the doctor and expressing to the doctor that the reason that I'm not able to provide the nebulizer treatments for my child is because my utilities aren't on a referral could be made to our office so that we could assist with getting the utilities back on dealing with the mom, helping her be able to provide the medical treatment that's necessary, thereby keeping the doctor from making a referral to protective services for non-compliance of medical treatment. Okay, so in terms of what your office would do, for example, in a utility situation or a rent situation, because sometimes, unfortunately, landlords shut off the utilities. Right. What's your office do to handle that situation? If a landlord has turned off the utilities, that is a constructive eviction. We would take the landlord to court and we would get the utilities turned back on. Because if a landlord wants to evict someone, they have to go to court and they have to get a court order to do that. They cannot shut off utilities in the home in order to force someone to move. I invite anyone who's listening to this show to call in with their questions because not only are you going to get direction, but you're going to get some free legal advice. Now, in terms of other constructive eviction situations besides shutting off utilities, repairs to the unit, for example? Yes. Whether it be a leaky faucet or a hole in the roof? Well, it, I would say a hole in a roof versus a leaky faucet. Um, so what, what we look at when we look at habitability issues or constructive eviction, we're looking to see if there's a condition in the home that would make it inhabitable, would make it such that no one would be able to live there safely. And we do instruct our clients on how to deal with those issues, how to put in writing their request to the landlord about making the, the required repairs in the home. And if a, uh, ten, if a tenant or one of our clients is deciding to not pay their rent because they believe that the home is inhabitable, we do advise them to put that money in escrow, to save that money. Because once you get to court and the issue comes up, and we're looking at abatement of rent, the judge is going to want to know, well, what did you do with the money that you didn't pay the landlord? So it always helps to save that money and put it in escrow. Let's talk about escrow for a moment. I've had other attorneys on and judges talk about escrow. But just to review escrow, that means that you take your rent money and you deposit it. Yes. And there's a safe place at the 36th District Court for that, isn't there? Yes. And right. You know the procedure for depositing it? I do not. <laughs> okay, well that's that's a good answer. If you don't okay. know, you don't you don't know. But generally the procedure is you go down there and 
you give them your address, and it's like posting a bond. You get an account, you give them the money, they give you a receipt for it, and you have to keep documentation every month while the proceedings are going on so that when you get to court, you can hand the receipts to the court and say, I have paid my rent, but I paid it into escrow account. Right. So now I've learned something about okay. escrow. <laughs> We're going to take a break for a minute. We'll be right back. Are you in legal trouble? Are you in need of legal advice? Or just have general legal questions? Watch Law Power Hour and get your questions answered by experienced attorneys who are experts in their field. Know your rights. Watch Law Power Hour, hosted by Barry Keller, attorney at law, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. here on WHPR, Detroit Live. You know, on the eviction issue, it just came to mind that there's a situation that I run into more often than I like to run into. The landlord is in foreclosure, and the landlord doesn't tell you that he's being foreclosed on. So all of a sudden, the landlord loses the house, and you've been paying rent to the landlord, and you get thrown out on the street. Have you run into that situation? We do see that uh, in our office, not as often as we used to. Um, we do see it uh, quite a bit as it relates to some of the tax foreclosure issues. So it's not just mortgage foreclosure where that issue comes up. It also comes up in tax foreclosure issues. Uh, generally speaking, if there is a lease in place, the lease has to be, um, they have to honor the lease that's in place. Um, but And then if the new owner wants to put the current tenant out, they do have to go to court to do that. So they, cannot, they can't use self-help. Okay, now let's say that somebody's renting the house and they have no interest in the real estate to a third person. In other words, I tell you, I, I own this property and I'm renting it to you, but I have no interest in the property. Well, they shouldn't be paying that person rent. And, and you can actually, uh, the records are public. They can go down to the Register of Deeds. They can look online to the Wayne, at the Wayne County Treasurers, and they can identify who the actual owner of the property is. Uh, we have seen people come into our office, and they have paid first and last month rent to someone who does not own the property, and they have just lost their money. Um, I do try to encourage people to first do a property search, identify who the owner of the home is, Always make sure that you have a good telephone number for the person who's saying that, who's holding themselves out as the owner of the home, not a, um, not, not a cell phone. Um, try not to meet the person in public, uh, in a public place to exchange money and to always use a form of um, money that can be, what's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> that can be traced. So never use cash. Uh, cashier's check or a check, or certified funds. Or money orders. Or money receipts. orders with receipts, yes. Now, let, let me ask you a question on this eviction issue. You've, you've given a good recipe here. Go down and check the records. Mm -hmm. If you go down to the Register of Deeds office and you want to get information, they generally don't give information to people who just walk in off the street, do they? You can check online now. 
Well, how do you do that? You can go online to the Register of Deeds, and if you know the address of the property, you can put that in and you can find out who the owner is. And if you can't do it at home because you don't have a computer? The public library. And, and most of us actually do have a computer. It's our phone, if you okay. have internet access. Okay, so there, there is a way of determining who the owner is. Yes. And let's say the person who's in the property says they're the owner, and you've gone online and it says that they're not the owner. Would you recommend that the money be paid into escrow at that point until it's cleared up? Yes, I would absolutely recommend that. Okay, one of the areas that you and I talked about a little earlier, domestic violence issues. Now, domestic violence is a crime, isn't it? Yes. So why would your office get involved in a domestic violence case? Well, there are any number of reasons. We would assist. We can assist with uh, personal protection orders. We can assist where an ex parte personal protection order has been received and the person who is under the protection order is trying to have that terminated. We also assist in domestic violence issues where there are where there is uh, where there are family law issues. It could be a divorce issue. It could be child custody, and it could also be a housing issue. We have run into cases where people in public housing who have been victims of domestic violence have been threatened with eviction by the housing authorities because they are victims of domestic violence. So those are the types of cases that we would get involved in so that we could protect the rights of the domestic violence survivors. On Monday I was in court and there were cross PPOs, personal protection mm -hmm. orders. She said that he brandished a gun and he said that she threatened him with a knife. Now they filed their own PPOs, and both of them were dismissed. Okay. So if somebody has a legitimate issue, if they come into your office for personal protection order, do you assist those individuals in filing for PPOs? We will advise them. There is, however, an entity that is actually at court on site that assists with helping people fill out the applications for personal protection orders. So we would either assist them or we would, pro we would refer them to the pro bono attorneys that are, are down at the court that are assisting uh, in that way. And you're familiar with the PPO procedure? I personally am not. Okay. You know what goes into the application? Yes, you, have, you do have to demonstrate that there is imminent threat of harm. And by eminent head of, th of harm, exactly what are you referring to? Um, that you're in danger. You have to, and you have to demonstrate with specificity that you're in danger. So I guess I do know a little bit about PPOs. <laughs> you do have to indicate with specificity that you're in danger. So you actually have to spell out the acts that occurred. So if you're saying that you were threatened, you have to be able to tell the court, on this date, at this time, I was threatened, and I was threatened in this way. And you also have to indicate to the court whether or not a weapon was used. Now, in terms of the domestic violence, what role does your organization play in domestic violence cases? As I said, we would assist with filling out the per, uh, personal protection orders, and we would also assist with defending the personal protection orders. Now, there is a civil action for domestic violence. A person who's been a victim of domestic violence can actually bring a lawsuit and receive monetary damages. I am not aware of that. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I was just curious as to whether you got involved in that. Well, our office does not handle those types of cases. Okay. Now, in terms of taxes, we talked about taxes, people being evicted because taxes haven't been paid. Does your office assist people who are behind in their taxes? Absolutely. We do have a uh, foreclosure division in our office, and we specifically handle tax issues. So if they want to contact our office, we would be able to assist them as it relates to tax foreclosure or, or back tax issues. And do you go down to the tax assessor's office with people and help them? We do work with the tax assessor to uh, enter into payment plans. And we have, in the past, worked directly with the office. And we've been on site when they've had uh, some of the big hearings uh, down at uh, Cobo Hall. And do you think more people are saving their houses today than they have been since 2008? Yes, I do. I, I know that the current Wayne County Treasurer, Eric Sabree, is working very, very hard to ensure that people know how much they owe. And I, I heard him speaking a couple weeks ago, and what he talked when he talked about the, the, the limited amount of money that people are losing their homes over, it was just incredible to me. I mean, the thousand and less than a thousand dollars, people are losing their homes. So I know that the Wayne County Treasurer's Office is 
active in getting information to the community about how they can come down and enter into a payment plan. I will say that one of the things that we have identified a lot of times is that the person who is living in the home may not be the um, owner of record. And so if you're not the owner of record, you cannot enter into a payment plan with the Wayne County Treasurer's Office. And those circumstances generally come up when someone has lived with their parents, say they've lived with their elderly parents, and the parent has died, and they have not probated the, proper, the, probated the estate and had the property transferred to their name. So I know that the Wayne County Treasurer's Office has assisted in uh, assisted with having the property transferred to the person who's living in the home so they can save it and our office has done the same thing okay let's walk through this because it's it sounds not, like a lot <laughs> it's, it's not unusual yes it's very realistic right I live with my parents for 40 years mm -hmm. my parents of blessed memory have passed away I'm still in the house functioning in the house unfortunately my parents aren't there doing what I do every day and getting up, taking care of the house, and going to work. Haven't even thought about changing right. the title to the property. Right. Have to change that title first to have standing on the taxes, right? Absolutely. Changing the title means that you've got to go to the probate court. Yes. In order to do that, you need to bring certain documents with you. Yes. Okay. For example, you have to prove that you are the person who has the right to the property. Right. If there are other heirs, you have to give notice to all the other heirs. Yes. You also have to bring the death certificates because they have to be filed when you change the deed. Right. And after all of that is accomplished, then the tax office will they will assist, you. right, because now you have standing. So as you said, the, the beginning is to go down to probate court, open up a small estate, bring all the documentation that you've discussed, and have the property transferred to you through probate. Okay. I'm going to add one question to this. Okay. Suppose you're already in tax foreclosure. Can you go down to the tax assessor's office and stop the foreclosure process by filing for the probate and explaining to the tax assessor what's occurred so you can hold on to that property it's going to depend on how many years you are in foreclosure. Sometimes people have two or three years where they have been foreclosed upon, and then it's going to do, they're going to have to look at where you are in the process, whether or not the property has actually been sold. Because if the property has already been sold in a foreclosure sale and there is a new person that owns the property now, then you may be out of luck as it relates to that. So as a general rule, would you agree with me, you should go and do this within two years of the last survivor in the house absolutely i mean absolutely if you're going to look at it that way i, mean, I it, suggest you know to take care of it as early as soon as you possibly can right but if your parents have passed away you ought to go down there with within two years if they paid the taxes to make sure that they've been paid and certainly if they haven't paid the taxes you ought to go down there and make arrangements to pay those taxes while you're transferring the property otherwise you're going to lose Right. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. And one of the other things is that the Wayne County um, Treasurer, they notify, they send notice after notice after notice. And the notices come in all different. I, they, they come in yellow. Once you get to the point where you're really in trouble, they're yellow notices. So pay attention to the notices. I know sometimes, you know, we're, we're living our lives and we're, we're living in crisis sometimes. But it's important to pay attention to the notices that are coming to the home because the Wayne County Treasurer's Office is making a concerted effort to try to keep people in their homes and to notify them of the status of the taxes on their property. I have to share a horror story with you. I mean, this is just incredible. In one of our clinics, a lady came in to see us. She'd been living in a house with her parents for 57 years. Wow. Mom and dad passed away. They were behind in the taxes. She didn't pay attention to the notices because she had a little stroke. Okay. More than two years went by. Man bought the property. He serves her with a notice to quit. That means you got to get out of the That's property. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he wants to turn around and rent the property back to her for $500 a month. And he bought it at a tax sale for $2,000. And listen up, it was only worth $40,000, the house. 
This is what happens when you don't do these things. That's right. And that's why we're here to serve you, to give you advice. This is what your office does. Yes. Now give them your number before we take a break. Okay. You can contact Legal Aid for our our telephone intake at 877-964-4700 or 313-967-5800. Now we're going to take a break for a minute. Are you in legal trouble? Are you in need of legal advice? Or just have general legal questions? Watch Law Power Hour and get your questions answered by experienced attorneys who are experts in their field. Know your rights. Watch Law Power Hour, hosted by Barry Keller, attorney at law, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. here on WHPR, Detroit Live. One of the areas that uh, we frequently bring up as a topic of discussion is expungement. And I know that you've participated in a number of expungement fairs, uh, not with your office, but through your organization, the Deltas, which is a sorority. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. In fact, uh, we all participated in the second program over at Second Ebenezer this year, didn't we? Yes. Would you share with the audience why expungement's important because I want people to understand I want to hear it from somebody else other than hearing it from me why expungement's important. Well what we've identified and our office actually does expungements um, but what we identified is that uh, it's life-changing. You come home you're a returning citizen having an expungement will allow you um, to get a job to get employment It helps to reintegrate returning citizens into society. There are some places who will refuse to allow you to live there if you have a felony record. And so an expungement can also help with housing. So expungements are life-changing. It's a way for us to help returning citizens reintegrate back into society, and it's a way for us to reduce recidivism. And what that means is it's a way to keep people from going back to prison. Let's go through the process a little bit. This is not a test. This is just a discussion. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I'm up for the task. <laughs> okay. What, what's the standard procedure? Let's say I've got two felonies. Am I eligible? If you have two felonies, you are not eligible. So the law changed in Michigan in 2015. And in 2015, the statute will now allow someone to get an expungement if they have one felony and no more than two misdemeanors. If you have two misdemeanors and no felony, then you can get your two misdemeanors expunged. You have to be five years from either your release from prison, your release from probation, or parole. Are there exceptions to the rule in which you cannot get expungement? Yes, there are certain offenses that cannot be expunged, and those are going to be what's considered life offenses in the state of Michigan. So carjackings, armed robberies, and uh, also certain types of criminal sexual conducts cannot be expunged. Now, in terms of expungement, if I get an expungement and I want to go out and apply for a job, after the expungement, and after I've been cleared, and it asks the question whether I have a conviction, do I have to answer that by saying yes, or can I put down no? You can say no. I will say with one caveat that there are certain kinds of jobs that you can apply for where they will be able to still see your record, and those are law enforcement jobs. 
and also the uh, armed forces will still be able to see copies of those records in the lane system. What about if you work for an education system? Because, you know, those are sensitive positions. Right. So there are certain positions, and as you indicated, there are certain positions that you will not be able to work in, even if you have an expungement. And if you get an expungement, it's going to help you in all areas of your life, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I, I, and we see it all the time. People come to us, and they want an expungement because they can't, they can't rent an apartment. And it's, this, is, this is in subsidized housing, but it shows up. It shows up on your credit report in the area of judgment if you have a criminal conviction. So what about subsidized public housing? Can they get it? It depends on the kind of offense that you've had. There cannot be a wholesale um, refusal to rent to someone who has a criminal background but they have to be able to look at the offense and they will determine whether or not the offense is one that is a public safety issue for public housing. But we do assist in denials for public housing. So if you have applied for public housing and you've been denied and you feel like you've been wrongfully denied, you can contact our office and we can assist with that appeal process. Hold on for a question. Good afternoon. Hi, um, I was listening to your show and heard you speaking of domestic violence. And I'm just curious, does that also, do you also offer services with respect to elder care abuse? I, I sometimes, you know, you hear stories in the neighborhood about old elderly people and I, you, they're complaining, you worry about them, but you don't really know where to turn. Police tell you to mind your own business. Can the elderly also come to you for some assistance? Is there some way they can contact you? And on that note, could you also put up your contact information again? Because I think I missed it. So we do provide assistance in any area of domestic violence. It does not have to be a um, romantic relationship. But as it relates to elder abuse, you can contact Adult Protective Services to file a report if you believe that someone who in, the, in your area is being abused and they are elderly, and those complaints can be made anonymously. And the Adult Protective Services, is that by county or city or? It, that's county. Kind of number? It's, it's like county, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the telephone number right off the top of my head. But it's a county service? Yes. Okay, and again, um, if you could give us your contact information for your office, so, because I missed it completely, I'm sorry. Sure, our telephone number for our telephone intake is 877-964-4700 or 313-967. 5800. We do also have online intake at www.ladadetroit.org. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Does your office make house calls for people who are infirmed and need your assistance? We have in the past gone to someone's home if okay. they need our assistance. I, I mean, you know, because there are a lot of individuals who can't get out and about yes. because of physical infirmities. And those individuals have tax problems. Those individuals have domestic violence problems. Yes, we do have community advocates, and that's what they do. They have gone, we have gone out to people's homes to um, do our client intake, and we've had attorneys speak with them over the phone, and if need be, we have gone to homes. So if somebody wanted to arrange to have a community advocate come to the house, what would they do? Well, the first thing that I would suggest is that they contact our office through our online intake or either telephone intake, and we can determine whether or not they're eligible and whether or not they actually have an issue that our office handles. And we'll do the intake, and then we'll move from there. Now, I made a note to myself about public benefits. If I'm denied public benefits, like if I want to get Medicaid, and I'm denied Medicaid. Yes. Can I come to your office and get assistance? Yes, you can. If I want to get food stamps and I'm denied food stamps, can I come to your office and get assistance? Yes, we do handle public benefits. We also, as I indicated earlier, we do handle Social Security disability and Social Security insurance. The only area that is outside our level of service is if your benefits have been terminated for overpayment and their allegations of fraud. Okay, in an overpayment situation, you're talking about Social Security? Yes. So in an overpayment situation, do you advise individuals about continuing to receive benefits while they're on appeal? Yes, we will advise them on how to handle that, but in terms of doing extended service on those cases, we do not do extended service on those types of cases. What about state aid cases? 
we handle those as well. Okay, as you know, if some individuals don't qualify for Social Security, they don't qualify for SSI, and they have an application pending for either disability or SSI because they're non-wage earners, they can apply to the state, can't they? Yes. And, and, they, if they, and if they receive those benefits, they may also receive medical coverage. Right. And what kind of medical coverage would they receive? Uh, Medicaid. And food stamps. Isn't yes. that true? Yes. So those benefits and those programs are available, correct? Yes, they are. And we do advise on those issues if someone contacts our office regarding applying for Social Security disability or Social Security insurance and they've been denied or they're in the process of waiting. We do advise them on ways that they can try to access other services or other income in the community. Now, in your partnership with Beaumont Hospital where the medical services are offered, do I need to have a medical card to get those services? No, not for our services. We do an eligibility uh, check, and as I indicated earlier, we just go through to see what your assets are, what your income is, and then we try to figure out a way to fit you in. We have a number of different funding sources. We don't want people to exclude themselves. They want us to contact. We want them to contact us, and we'll look to see how best we can find a way to service the clients in our area. If I come in with a criminal matter, to your office. You're not going to handle it, are you? We will not handle that matter. Yeah, I just want to get clear on this so everybody understands. Right. I come in with the drunk driving matter. Legal aid will not assist in that matter. We only handle civil legal issues. And even we even exclude certain types of civil legal issues. So if it's a personal injury matter, our office would not handle that. We have, um, we have priorities and we do have level of service. And we've identified that for our client population, there are certain types of cases where there is a critical need. And that is in the area of housing. We look at landlord-tenant issues. We look at mortgage foreclosure, tax foreclosure issues. We look at consumer issues. We look at uh, domestic violence issues. And we also handle any type of public benefits issues. So we've identified those areas as areas of critical need for our client population. And we try not to handle cases that are outside of those priorities and those level of services. How many attorneys do you have in your offices? We currently have 14 attorneys in our office. And how many individuals are you servicing? Last year, we, pro we opened 12,000 cases. And uh, you actually serviced 12,000 individuals <laughs> last year? Yes. Well, for some of those cases, uh, it, it could be one client that comes in that has multiple um, legal needs, but we opened over 12,000 cases last year. We have another question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. Keller, um, what is your guest name? And you want to share that information? Oh, I my TV they want to know about you. But I hear echo. My name is Regina Thomas. My name is Regina Thomas. Okay. And do you handle? Do you have people that have problems with uh, DTE? DTE problems. We're, we're not currently handling utility issues in our office. Our level of service is uh, housing. Landlord, tenant, mortgage foreclosure, public benefits, and the like. Oh, okay. All right, then, Miss Regina. Thank you. Thank you. You all have a good evening. You, you too. too. Well, thank you for coming today, and I wish you good luck in your election. Thank you for having me. Please come back next week. We're going to have a very interesting program dealing with workers disability compensation benefits. Thanks for listening to Law Power Hour.